Hello, this is Kerry Schutz with MathWorks. In this video, I'm going to show how to measure the transfer function of an unstable plant without breaking the control loop. The technique I'll use is called the double cross technique. It involves computing two cross spectrums, taking their ratio to form a complex transfer function estimate. Now you may be asking why are we interested in measuring uh, the transfer function of an unstable plant to begin with. And to start answering that, I'm going to go over and jump into a Simulink model. So here we are in Simulink and we have here our unstable device under test. It happens to be a very simple single pole low pass filter where that pole is in the positive uh, S plane at 0 0.5, making it unstable. Now, on the bottom view here, we see it's connected as part of a larger control system. In this case, we're assuming that this device under test, or plant, you could also call it, was just a given. It was something that we started with. It's not something under our control. And now we have to design uh, some um, controller sensor technology around it to stabilize the overall response to accomplish whatever goal we're after here. And so in this case, we're just using a very simple uh, Unity controller and Unity feedback. Okay, so, so there's really nothing fancy going on here. It's just to illustrate the concept that we can move from an unstable plant to a stable closed loop system. And in fact, in this particular case, we're just flipping uh, the pole around the J omega axis from plus 0.5 to minus 0.5, again, creating a stable system. So if we were to run this model, we'll see that these two uh, waveforms are exactly the same. We can look at this on our scope and we'll see indeed they both have a uh, settling time of around 10 seconds or so or at least a rise time in that time range. Okay so so that's the good news we can stabilize the system but then what if you were tasked with the job of saying well um, we don't know what this device under test transfer function is we only know what the closed loop response is so how do we uh, measure just the uh, device under test as transfer function. Well, one way you could say, well, well, let's just pull it out and we will apply a step, maybe some noise or some, some uh, series of sine waves. And from that, we'll deduce or compute the transfer function. And so that's what I've done in the top view of the model, okay? Um, because at the bottom view here, whenever we take a measurement on this side in response to a step, we're not getting the transfer function of the device under test, we're getting the closed loop response. And so up here, we're getting just the uh, device under test response. So let's just run it with a step and see what we get. And if we look at that view, you'll see that uh, the response quickly just shoots off to a near near infinity. Here it's up at after 100 seconds, the response is up to uh, you know over six times 10 to the 21st volts. Okay, so clearly that's not a, a feasible measurement in practice. We could cut it back to 10 seconds, and we'll see the response is still shooting up to about 175 volts after 10 seconds. You know, it's it's not a stable system, clearly, no matter what we put in. If we put in random noise instead of a step, we'll see it. Does that do any better? Um, no, I mean, it doesn't ramp up exponentially quite as fast, but it's still ramping up. Uh, it's up to 80-something um, volts after 10 seconds. If we go to a 1-volt sine wave um, at 1 hertz sine wave and 1-volt amplitude, we could switch that and run that. And we'll see that there is some uh, sine wave-like activity for the first four or five seconds. But then, as you see, as we go longer, longer in time, it just um, quickly, you know, exponentially increases, even with a zero um, DC, uh, you know, no bias to the sine wave. It still, you know, ramps up to infinity over time. So that's not really a feasible uh, device under test characterization approach. Uh, again, you could try that. Maybe you could do some curve fit to it. But in general, that's not a very safe uh, or robust measurement approach. If this were an electromechanical system, you wouldn't want to drive it off, um, you know, off the hinges, so to speak. So, you know, so let's look at a better technique. A better technique would be to use the device under test how it would actually be used in practice as part of its control system. You would you would uh, set it up at, let's say, its operating point, and then you would take some measurements, let's say, on the input and the output of the device under test in situ without breaking the loop. Therefore, we can use our control loop to maintain stability 
and maybe use whatever signal is here or, or that we inject here uh, to ascertain the frequency response of the system. So there's kind of two parts to it. There's the kind of operating point slash normal operation of the system. And then there's the, going to have how about adding some small signal perturbation uh, to that normal operating behavior to characterize your device under test. And so that's exactly what we're going to do next. Finally, here is our model where we introduce the double cross-spectrum transfer function measurement technique. We have our same device under test here, 1 over S minus 0.5, our unstable plant or device under test, and it's connected as part of a stable uh, closed loop control system with negative feedback. In front of the device under test, we have some arbitrary controller. I just put in this particular model just that we could English uh, such that we could easily distinguish between the open loop response of just, let's say, the device under test by itself versus the uh, closed loop control system with uh, negative feedback in the controller. It makes it the, the two very, very different. Okay, so the first thing I'll do here is just run the model. Um, I'm Again, I'm adding a measurement noise uh, to, to the output as well to mimic you know what would occur in reality. We would always have some level of measurement noise. And later I'm going to connect up our double cross spectrum estimator block, but we're just first going to start uh, by ignoring that and just looking at how the system responds to a step in closed loop. So let's do that and we have our scope over here. I can stop this model. There's no need to run it very long and we'll zoom in horizontally um, to the first part and we'll see that um, it's um, it, the system has overshoot and undershoot it's it's definitely ringy and then you can visibly see the um, the measurement noise in steady state the effect of that okay so now we know what the uh, how the closed loop system behaves now the question is how can we tease apart the response of just the device under test by itself Again, the motivation for doing that would be uh, to allow us to uh, design a controller around that particular device under test. So the technique I'm showing applies equally well to stable systems as it does to unstable systems. I just wanted to point out that it works for unstable device under test as well. And so what we're going to do now is connect up our transfer function measurement block. We're going to perturb the controls the uh, correction signal coming out of our controller by some small amount. This is going to be a signal of small amplitude. In fact, it's going to be a random excitation is what we use here, random noise of some level. Uh, our response will come from the noisy uh, plant or device under test output. We're assuming we don't have access to the device under test itself, only the noisy uh, version thereof. And our reference is going to be the device under test input, okay, after we've added our perturbation signal to it. Okay, as far as the setup of this block is concerned, um, I have it set to analyze the device under test over some bandwidth. In this case, I think it's 10 hertz. Uh, there it is, 10 hertz. Uh, the excitation level is just 10 millivolts. And the I'm going to use a random excitation. I could also use a chirp excitation. Uh, FFT size in my case is 1024 and I'm doing 100 averages and hold off is 100 seconds. So I'm going to wait until the system settles down before I start doing my spectral averaging. Okay, so that's the setup. And then later we'll go under the hood of this block. But in short, what it's doing is computing these two cross spectrums. It's computing the cross spectrum between the excitation, E, conjugate thereof, with the response, in this case noisy, uh, response of the plant Y on this signal line and normalizing or dividing by the cross spectrum of that same excitation with the reference signal, the plant input. Okay, so let's go ahead and run that. We'll run it again for that same simulation time, 2000 seconds, and we'll see how it performs. Now we see we've got the theoretical magnitude uh, response in the upper right in yellow. And the same below, we've got the, the theoretical responses here, magnitude and phase in yellow, with the measurement in blue overlaid. And you can see it is a little noisy with the effect of the measurement noise. That also helps us distinguish between which waveform is which easily uh, visually without necessarily looking up here at the plot legend to distinguish. We could always turn one off if we wanted to see one just by itself or turn it back on.
But we see overall it's a very, very good estimator of the theoretical uh, frequency response, both magnitude and phase. So that's, that's sort of the good news here. So let's go ahead and take a dive under the double cross spectrum estimator and see what it's doing. Okay, so the first thing we notice here is that it's generating some band limited excitation. And in this case, I, if you saw before, I did select a random a noise excitation. We could also select that chirp and that would have some nice advantages as well, but we're just starting with, I would say, the most common form of uh, system characterization excitation, that being a random noise signal. And then there's also two other signals of interest. We have our uh, reference signal, which is the input to the uh, device under test, and the response, which is the output of our device under test. So we uh, low-pass filter, anti-alias filter those, we resample them. And then, and this is where the 25.6 kilohertz rates comes in. And then we get into the heart of our transfer function estimator. Those same three signals coming in. And do note that it is a three signal input to our transfer function estimator, not a dual input. Just in the, in the previous case where we computed the auto spectrum and the cross spectrum, we only had the reference and response inputs. Now we've got three of them. That's one difference between this technique and the previous I showed in a uh, similar video. If we go underneath, what we'll see is we have two cross-spectrum estimator blocks. This is where the name double cross-spectrum comes in, two cross-spectrums. And we're using a block from the DSP system toolbox for that purpose. In fact, it's aptly named the cross-spectrum estimator block. And you can see that the inputs are, again, for one case, the response and the excitation, cross-spectrum thereof. And for the other, it's the reference signal and the excitation, cross-spectrum thereof. And I put up here some notes about specifics about, you know, which order we put the inputs into the blocks and whether we're doing conjugations or not, because this block also does internal conjugation. So you just have to work out, shall we say, the details to get it right as far as, you know, the order of the inputs and where the conjugations take place in order uh, to get the right, in particular, phase response. Uh, the magnitude response is not so picky about that, but to get the phase response right, you do have to get the, uh, the inputs into the right ports. And so that's what these notes above are for. We take the ratio of these two cross-spectrum outputs. We compute the transfer function estimate here, and we separate it into magnitude and phase. And that's ultimately what is plotted and displayed on these two spectrum analyzer blocks, which are functioning, if we just take quick note, in frequency domain input mode. That meaning we're only using these two blocks as display devices. They are not actually doing any uh, computation. They're not computing FFTs, no filtering, no averaging, no windowing, just merely display blocks. And again, you see here the hold off, and that's where I um, had that 100 seconds of hold off to ignore any sort of transient uh, or ramp up time of the uh, system. And that would include any sort of transient response associated with the device under test or anti-alias filters or other dynamics associated with the measurement. I want to get everything into nice steady state before we start doing the spectral averaging. Okay, so that's about all I wanted to really say about this uh, particular measurement technique using this very, very simple device under test to illustrate the concept. Um, again, the major points are if you want to measure the response of an unstable device under test, the, the best approach is to, of course, uh, design some controller around it that stabilizes that device under test, puts it at some good operating point, and then use some small signal perturbation to characterize the device under test at that particular operating point. And now, there are many practical applications of this a, a measurement approach, this double cross spectrum measurement te uh, technique. And in a future video, I'll probably uh, show one of those uh, on some type of switching power system. All right, that's it for now. Thank you for tuning in, and until next time, signing off.